Sweet. OK, so hello uh, <clears throat> again. Uh, now that we got a good portion of that awkwardness out of the way, hopefully we will not have uh, too terribly much to go forth. Name's Richard Rissanen. Uh, my handle is the Karmikaze. I'm an aspiring developer and a closet blues musician. Um, I kind of fell into programming, and we're going to talk about that in a second. But right now, we're going to do like this whole talk's on an introduction to Sinatra and Sinatra chassis. Uh, just a show of hands, who has had some experience with Sinatra? Wow. OK. So you get, this is a pretty introductory thing. So this might be a little bit of review. And then maybe you guys could call me out if there's any errors. I actually wrote this last night and didn't check for errors. So <laughs> might have a little bit of fun. <clears throat> All right. So my background. Uh, I was born in 1985. So the only reason it has any significance is I kind of remember when the Berlin Wall fell. Um, it was impactful to me because, you know, I couldn't figure out why people were so angry at a wall. Um, <laughs> anyways, so three years ago, like I said, I did not know how to code. Um, this is kind of a big deal that I wanted to push, is that I literally, in my experience prior to three years ago was I had built a single site. Um, no JavaScript, just HTML, CSS, and it was awful. It was awful. So I, I, I got into it because basically I had a band and I was too cheap to pay a developer. So sorry, guys. Um, so in the three years that I've been a developer, I've been involved with a couple of startups. And unfortunately, they all failed. Uh, I tried to be a business owner. And I have like kind of a consultancy myself. And I just I never actually do anything with it. I just go, oh, yeah, I have a consultancy. And then it never really goes anywhere. Um, I worked for a media production company in Atlanta called Tomorrow Pictures. And that's where I got a bulk of my Sinatra experience. Um, I had already been using it with the startups and whatnot, but most of those ended up falling out in about six months, whereas I was with them for about a year and a half. Uh, I occasionally work on open source stuff, a little bit, kind of. It's very sporadic. And right now, I work for a consultancy out of Boston called Cyrenix. Um, and I work on their behalf for Cumberland Farms Gulf Oil on an app called SmartPay. Uh, SmartPay, essentially, it allows you to pay for your gas and activate the pump um, by your iPhone or Android, or even mobile web. So it's a pretty cool thing. Uh, I just got promoted, so that's awesome. I'm now lead developer. Uh, and I am super stressed out. Like It, it happened like two weeks ago. And we have this massive, massive like Ruby on Rails event machine. You know, we have an Android app, we have an iPhone app, the JavaScript, HTML5 app, and it's me and two part-time guys. And that's it. And so that's why. You know, but and what it all comes down to is it's really just first world problems. Like I have an awesome job and I've got really good position that I wouldn't have thought I would have. And so I'm grateful, but super stressed. All right, so I want to bring it back a little bit to actually relevance. Um, so I've, I'm an advocate of change, community, and transparency. And one of the things that I've always liked about the Atlanta Ruby group when I used to live here six months ago was that everybody was always so welcoming. And you know, just it was very, very little judgment that was ever passed. You know, it, if you just didn't know something, you could ask, and people were like really, really cool about it, and just they would try to help you if they could, and or turn you to someone that actually could. So, I'm hoping that eventually, by doing some talks and things like that, I can give back to the community a little bit. And if you've ever drank with me, you know what the transparency thing is. It's like I am just blunt, and I say whatever comes to my mind, and uh, we'll touch base on the advocate advocate of change uh, later. So. All right, so let's get into it. So we got Sinatra, which essentially is a lightweight DSL in Ruby. Um, obviously, as the notes say, it's based off request and response. Um, what I like about this, obviously, is um, simply put, it's really, really easy for beginners to grasp the concept of Sinatra. 
Um, I know that me, I only had to sit down for about 20 minutes and have a conversation with somebody, and I got it. Uh, one of the hardships that, as a beginner, you can run into is that you have to sit here and learn a programming language, and then you have to find a way to structure all that code. And it becomes a little daunting of a task if you get thrown into something like Rails and you just learned what loops were. And so Sinatra, I think, is a good introduction because it allows you to write really bad code, um, just like horrid code. And I've, I've written bad code most of my career, and now I think I'm getting a little bit OK. Uh, so it's, it's just one of those things. And it, it's how I learned, and it's how I think others should learn, or at least take a peek while they're learning. Uh, so here's a really basic example of a Sinatra app. I mean, this is literally just pulled from the uh, documentation. And I mean, all we've got here is essentially we're requiring Sinatra, and then we have a route. right? And so we'll break down the route a little bit. And you have an HTTP method, a route pattern, and code to be executed. And that's, you know, it's, it's pretty, pretty, pretty simple. The HTTP method is obviously get. The route pattern is slash. And then the code to be executed is what's in between do and end. So, you know, I, I think that's exactly why they gave it is just such a simple example. Um, now, on that, you can actually have trailing question marks at the end of your route patterns, which would make, in that instance, the slash like optional. Um, you probably know that from other form of like regular expressions and whatnot, but um, it's you know good. They are executed in order. Routes are always executed in order from top to bottom. Um, when you're writing maybe slightly inefficient code as, as a beginner, uh, sometimes you have routes that are very similar to one another that could probably be refactored down into one route. But if that's not the case, if not refactored, uh, it's very important. So once again, they're executed in, from top to bottom. Because I had a couple of early apps where I couldn't figure out why some code was not being executed because two similar routes, and it was being caught by the one before it. Um, so something to keep in mind. And then we have, let's see, name, name parameters are, oh, OK, they're parts of the route pattern that also proceed with a colon. So we'll go talk about those a little bit more. <clears throat> um, so name parameter is just like a placeholder, which allows any string to take place of the route pattern, like with the actual colon preceding it. So when a request is being made using a name parameter, uh, Sinatra actually goes and finds and creates a params hash. Now, walk, hold on and just walk with me with this, this next part of this sentence, because this was very difficult for me to write. Uh, so it creates a params hash using a parameter as the key in the string that has taken its place as the value. Does that make sense? OK, thank you. Awesome, awesome. I, I, like I said right here, I promise I tried to find a clearer way to say that, but that's what it is. So name parameters example. You have get Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle and then name. Obviously, name being with the colon preceding it would be the name parameter. and as it's created a params hash, you can actually use it and get params name is the best turtle. So if it was Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle Michelangelo, then Michelangelo is the best turtle is what would be returned. OK, so views. Um, this is pretty simple stuff. Uh, when you get a request for like slash index in this example, um, Sinatra will go to the views folder and return index ERB, uh, the ERB actually being the kind of important part. Uh, Sinatra has support for around, I think, 20 templating languages. But the ones I end up using the most are Markdown, ERB, and Haml. Um, I, there's plenty of other ones you can utilize. But for most of my development, that's all I use. Uh, let's see. Yeah, so by default, um, views are also like actually just in the views folder of like an application. That's where Sinatra is going to go look for it. Uh, as I understand it, I believe that might actually be a rack convention that is just brought in by Sinatra. But if anybody knows, you can correct me on that. Um, or later. Uh, so it is configurable. And you can do that and as like right here, where you just say set views, and then settings that route plus templates. And then you go look in templates instead of views. 
Okay, so what's this? Layouts. All right, yeah, well, layouts are pretty easy. Um, by default, Sinatra will go look in whatever your views folder is, and if there is a file called layout, uh, it will try to render the index through the layout in this example. Uh, well, this example's admin, but it, it, would, it would try to render the index through the actual layout file um, So as a partial. Uh, so you would need to make sure that you had a yield statement in the actual um, template itself, the layout template. Uh, you can also assign it to false, which would be no template, and that's just layout false. And then in this example, layout and admin, which would just pull a admin layout versus, or yeah, admin.erb as the uh, layout instead of just layout.erb. So you can have helpers and Helpers in Sinatra are, like these are actually just, I pulled these examples out of some old code that I'd written. Um, so we have what? Uh, authenticate method, which just redirects to sign in unless there's a session user. And then in the example below it, it says get admin do authenticate. And it just, basically your helpers methods are accessible by your routes as long as they've been um, loaded first, so either at the top of the page or one of the files beforehand. Let's see. Okay, cool, that was that one. All right, and then you, there's also filters, which you know, if you've done any Rails, anything as far as like testing and RSpec and whatnot, uh, I use before filters like crazy so I don't have to repeat myself. And then you can do things like before admin and then put a wild card after it so that anything like these two routes right here would actually run authenticate prior without actually having to put authenticate in at, uh, each one of those. And that can be helpful especially when you have like a bunch of like in RSpec being the greatest example unfortunately. I'm quoting Rails in a Sinatra talk but um, or RSpec but yeah. Just move on from that. I'm a little tongue tied. Uh, Okay, cool. So it also has error handling. And error handling is uh, something I don't use as much, but it was really fun to play with when I was trying to write a blog post because, uh, well, I don't know, I, like, I kind of like breaking stuff every once in a while and just trying to figure out how the innards work. And it's, you know, it's, it's fun to play with. So you know, if you get a request that is made for slash missing route in the example uh, right here, uh, Sinatra would throw a, not, a Sinatra not found exception and return this seems to be missing. Um, and that's essentially because, you know, not found, this seems to be missing, do. I mean, pretty, pretty basic, I, I would think. And then, okay, as if a get request was made for just slash, Sinatra would return, oh no, your app blew up, since index is actually, this is wrong, it's not a symbol. Uh, and it would just, you know, bubble up to the error method right there. So as far as Sinatra goes, it's a simple and easy way to, like, simple, it's like a micro framework. So it's, you know, it's easy way to develop web applications in Ruby. Uh, as your code grows in complexity, so in, in your needs, you can actually sit there and expand out the libraries, pull in things, and get additional configuration. Uh, one of my former complaints with Rails was that it has a lot of boilerplate. Uh, but depending on what you're working on, sometimes that's needed. Uh, all my personal projects, I tend to hop to Sinatra because they're usually so focused. I have a limited subset of features that are, you know, I can hammer out in a couple of hours without the need of something a little hefty like Rails. All right, and I would recommend that if you even have a remote interest in it, you read the docs, or if you're working with it, you just read the docs because as far as anything I've ever hit online, they have some of the best docs. Um, you know, Google with their uh, Maps API tends to be either outdated or very hard to find what you're looking for, whereas like this, it's a page and not a very long one at that. So that's Sinatra there. <clears throat> now, that's great, but I didn't show you actually how to build an application, like at all. I just showed you kind of the basics of what it could be capable of using. And so that's what Sinatra Chassis is. Uh, Sinatra Chassis essentially is a gem that it acts like a boilerplate 
for Sinatra. So when you use Sinatra chassis, you get a default structure. You can actually, I think it's, uh, what is it? Chassis test app. And you would actually get a test app. And in it, you would have this, uh, app.rb, which would hook all the pieces together. Uh, the config.ru, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, your gem file, which you know keeps all your external libraries and whatnot. Gemfile.lock, same thing. Public, obviously, where all your JavaScript, HTML uh, goes, and your assets, more or less. Uh, rake files, going to be all your tasks. And readme, temp, views, those are pretty self-explanatory. But that way, you don't actually have to go and create each individual one and do it yourself. Uh, just saves you a little bit of time. Now, what's really cool is, like I said, uh, my former complaint with Rails was all the boilerplate. And what I'm suggesting to you now is to actually use something else that creates boilerplate. But it's really, really easy to configure. Um, for instance, in the app.rb file, this is what the required directory method is. So if you want to add, say, uh, settings folder, you would just throw it in there in the array, and it's good. If you wanted to remove uh, models, views, or no, models and controllers, and just put in a like routes folder, you know, actually just leave the routes folder and write everything on one actual directory, you could do that as well. Uh, so config.ru, uh, essentially it's two lines. Uh, all it does is load the app and then put it on a rack server. Um, I just consider it magical. I have actually have not read very much into Rack, and I'm a little disappointed with myself because of that, but uh, should definitely do that. I just say that's where the magic happens, and then all of a sudden it will work online. So uh, the next thing that I would say is adding a database seems like it could kind of be important. Um, you know, I don't have a single, well, no, that's not true. My blog doesn't have a database, but that's because I just render markdown files. Uh, parse them and like render them or whatever on the fly. Uh, so there's actually extensions to Sinatra chassis. And yes, I know this is getting kind of weird in the way it's being abstracted, but all the extensions are gems that are essentially wrappers of other gems, but with additional libraries or code so that you can get some configurable options without actually having to go and read through the docs and do everything for you. So the one I want to talk about is the chassis data mapper extension. Um, data Mapper obviously being a ORM that you can use for Ruby development. Uh, so easiest way to get this to start working in, say, a Sinatra chassis app is you would add to the gem file the chassis data, data mapper, uh, yeah, require it, and then bundle install, run rake DM setup, and then it gives you configure blocks for dev in production, and everything's commented out for you. And then you can just go in and uncomment it up what you want and fill in the variables. That way you don't have to read all the data mapper documentation on actually how to figure out to, how to do that. Um, the data mapper gem is also added to the gem file. And then data mapper.finalize is added to your models. And that all happens like magically when you run the rake DM setup. Does everything for you, configures it, and gets it ready. And then you have to bundle install one more time because the data mapper gem is actually added to your gem file. Okay, so when you run rake DM setup, this is actually an example of what you would end up getting. Um, and as you can see, you have configuration set up for uh, SQLite uh, in memory and then regular SQLite, like, and then you have MySQL, Postgres. And it's all just, you fill in the variables, uncomment it, and it's, it's very, very simple. Okay. And then adding a database, you'll get a couple extra um, rake tasks that you can use. And you can generate models with rake DM add model and then user. And I believe that will also add corresponding test, um, just like basic you know, um, skeleton for your test files. But it will create a test folder. and also throw that in there and create a models folder with the corresponding uh, files needed. So like user.rb and everything like that. Uh, you get migrations, which I will be honest, I never use them in personal projects, um, at least not when it's Sinatra. Uh, and then you have seeding, obviously, which is, you know, eh, I think a little bit essential 
Okay, so some of the fun stuff that it has is like uh, CoffeeScript in SAS. It will do precompiling of assets. Uh, it will do precompile and it will do uh, decompile, uh, which is just essentially you can write everything in, say, CoffeeScript. And in development mode, it will just sit there and actually refresh and reload the CoffeeScript in uh, every request. Uh, that doesn't, that's not ideal in production. So you can actually hook these into your deployment scripts or just run them manually and actually precompile so that uh, it'll minify and do all that brilliant stuff that I just don't terribly care about myself and just automate it. Uh, there's an assets path if you want to change it. It's right there. But I typically don't have a reason to. I mean, public is usually good enough for me, and I'll just start throwing everything into the public folder. Uh, ooh, mobile templates. So we're going to go back to that. Um, so when I did start, I was primarily doing a lot of websites versus actual applications. And so one of the things that I always ran into was uh, responsive web design and or kind of like, I, I guess, what's, what's the term for the other one? Reactive? It's not reactive, but like where you would actually sit there and adaptive. Adaptive, thank you. Yeah, and so typically I just go with responsive now, nowadays. But if you, for any reason, feel that in your Sinatra Chassis app that you would actually need uh, mobile views, you could just enable them with the enable mobile views option. And then they'll be uh, in the settings folder, the line set mobile user agents. And it's just very, very generic. Uh, it catches pretty good stuff, but you can just add to that array if you need any additional user agents to catch. And then that way, when someone makes a request, it will actually go and search into your views folder and see if there is a .mobile, .whatever template you're using. So if you're using a .erb, it will go look and see if there's a .mobile, .erb, and it will load that first if it's mobile versus the actual .erb file. All right, so there's catch-all routing. And um, this is something that I ended up disabling a lot uh, just because I was maybe not being responsible with the way I was actually handling my routes and my views, to be perfectly honest. And, uh, but what that ends up doing is when a route is not found, uh, Sinatra will send up a 404, and Chassis will intercept it and go hop into the views folder and try to find a corresponding um, directory and file. So say, you know, name Richard is the route that was hit, and it throws a 404. So it's going to go into your views file or your views folder, look for a directory name, and then look for the file Richard. And if it's there, it's going to return that. Uh, so you could technically do, if you really wanted, I wouldn't recommend it, uh, a static site with no routes, and just make sure your directory structure was appropriate, and it would just catch it and actually load all the templates accordingly. Uh, some other little things that they have is, you know, you, like I said, we have tests, so you can actually run tests. We use mini-test, I believe, for it. And then you can add rake tasks, just add a dot rake to the, uh, rake, the task folder. And then there's an interactive Ruby shell, which is the same thing as like a Rails console, where you can actually load your app into an IRB session. And it's, that's useful. I, I use that pretty much all the time. Um, so there's helpers, which I, I wasn't really going to go over today, but I want to just make you aware that these helpers do exist. Uh, they're not too terribly big, but uh, what they do is just little things. They're mainly UI things like active links, you know, um, alerting users, uh, date selectors, hiding elements, numerability, titles, and truncation. So honestly, the docs for Sinatra Chassis is it's pretty good. So I would say just check that out if you wanted to play with them. And then the great thing, like I said, about all of this is you, you can actually see all the source code and like read through it in like two hours. Uh, it's a very, very small project. And um, you get a good idea of how everything works. And you can even go in there and like modify uh, most, most of the stuff. The idea that we were trying to get across when we started working on this, um, and I've just been a bouncing board. I haven't actually been much of a contributor, but I've been kind of like patient zero. Uh, is that we wanted people to be able to quickly prototype apps and to go through and have a lot of the helpers that they may need, but 
and have some conventions with the configuration, but allow you to change anything you wanted. Um, I, we didn't really want to instill that you have to do it the Rails way and or you have to do it the Sinatra chassis way. So we tried to make everything very easy to modify and or change. Okay, so the advocate of change thing is, it's, it's, it's another thing that I wanna push definitely to the uh, beginner devs. And it's something I would definitely push to anybody that's like stuck or dead, like you know, stuck in their job and kind of like unhappy with it is, uh, I started my career, like I said, three years ago. And everything that has helped my career started from what I thought was either foolish or really bad thing that happened to me, I thought at the time. So like I started my career because my girlfriend of six years dumped me. And I ended up moving 600 miles away because I want to be away from that girl and reading a couple of books on programming and got my first job and it was awesome. And then I got a job in Atlanta and it was, it was great and I was making what I thought was good money until a couple of you guys told me it wasn't. <laughs> Thank you for that. And so uh, my best friend, the guy that actually wrote Sinatra Chassis, called me up one day and was like, hey, do you want to quit your job and move to the beach? And this is where I moved, uh, West Palm. It's a beautiful city, but it was a very foolish act at the time because I had a lease in Atlanta, I quit my job, didn't have any prospects, and got a lease in West Palm. 15 minute walk to the beach. So you can imagine how expensive that was. Um, but what ended up happening was in six weeks, I ended up getting my current position with Cumberland Farms, Gulf Oil, and Cyrenix, doing the consulting for Cumberland Farms. And I tripled my income. Um, I would push onto everyone that this is a seller's market, and the people that have the power are the people that actually can do it. And if you're not comfortable with what you're doing, don't do it. Go somewhere else. There is somebody that will hire you today, and if not today, tomorrow. So that's kind of the big thing for me. And I think we might be done. Ah, yeah. So once again, I'm Richard Rissanen uh, at the Karmakazi. It's everywhere online. I actually have a very extensive, um, well, extensive, it's like 17 paragraph blog post uh, on the karmakazi.com going in depth into Sinatra. Uh, it's basically I just sat down, read the docs one day, and kind of hammered out a little more clarity for some of the examples. Um, and then Sinatra Chassis is right there at Ruby Gems if you're interested in looking at it. And we're always looking for contributors, even if it's just to help write documentation, because we hate doing that. <laughs> All right, so that's pretty much it. Any questions? Hey, what's up? So I actually haven't heard of chassis. I'm a big Sinatra fan. Is this related to the Petrino project at all? No, no, no. Actually, um, kind of a funny story. Uh, this, in its original, um, rendition was called Vesper two years ago, and we posted it on Hacker News, and it kind of had a different um, focus, but it essentially was still based off trying to be able to configure everything, and it hit the front page of Hacker News, and the Pedrino guys actually started getting in an argument with us in the thread about um, how is this any different and whatnot, and what it really comes down to is I still feel that Pedrino, at least from when I was playing with it back then, was trying to enforce conventions upon you and a way of writing code. And what we try to do is give you the freedom to make mistakes because those mistakes are what make you better. You know, like I always hated the idea of conventions over configuration until I finally one day sat down and started writing RESTful services and went, oh no, shit. <laughs> so did that answer your question? Yeah, sure. Cool. Anybody else? Wow. <laughs> Silence. <laughs> Sweet. Well, thank you. <laughs>